Uh, 21st Century Meat and Dairy Panel. Uh, my name is Jim Slama, the president of FamilyFarm.org, uh, one of the producers of the conference. I uh, hope you're having a good time. Um, yeah, how about it? Um, we've got a great panel. I'm just so honored to be joined by uh, this esteemed group of people who are leaders in you know various aspects of um, good food. And um, so I'm going to just start with some brief introductions on each, each panelist, and then we'll share some questions and hear more about their stories and plot out the future of the good food and good meat and good dairy revolution. Um, our, and when I just start here to my uh, immediate left, um, Chris Ely. And Chris is the co-founder of Applegate and helped bring organic and antibiotic-free meat products to the market. Uh, he's been able to take his life experience of growing up on a farm in New Jersey that raised black angus, turkeys, horses, and ponies, along with working in his family's special and meat business, and apply it to growing Applegate into the leading natural and organic deli meat company in America today. Uh, seeing an opportunity to create the specialty meat products, he returned to his family's meat business, uh, partnered up with Steve McDonald, uh, and now they have Applegate Farms, which is really an amazing company. And you know, I'm a, as one of their customers, uh, I think they've done a really uh, fabulous job in, in creating that line. Uh, Chris is involved in Slow Food, the OTA Board of Directors Organic Trade Association, and uh, we're glad to have you, Chris. Thank you. Um, next to Chris you. is Bill Nyman. Uh, and just about anybody who knows anything about sustainable meats knows the name Bill Nyman. Uh, currently he heads up BN Ranch uh, in Marin County, uh, where he's a cattle and turkey rancher, and um, uh, also previously was the founder of the natural meat company Nyman Ranch, and has been providing natural, natural, naturally raised beef, pork, and lamb to fine restaurants and retailers for more than 30 years. Uh, you know, he's one of the first people selling to, you know, white tablecloth San Francisco Bay restaurants, including Alice Waters and others, uh, and uh, his animals were always raised using traditional natural methods, uh, eschewing hor hormones, antibiotics, and, and others. Um, over the years, Nyman Ranch grew to over 700 farms and ranches, and, um, you know, has gained a reputation as one of the best tasting, tasting beef and pork uh, uh, lamb on the market. Uh, Bill is also a member of Pew Foundation's National Commission on Industrial Farm Production, and uh, which released recommendations for reforming the nation's live livestock industry in April 2008. Uh, he and Nicolette were featured in Time Magazine's cover story on the crisis in American agriculture. Bill, those are some really good pictures, by the way. <laughs> you know, when it's like two thirds of a page in Time Magazine out on the ranch, I was quite impressed. Um, and uh, uh, he is Nicolette. Uh, and he co-authored the Nyman Ranch Cookbook, uh, which was selected as one of the year's best cookbooks by the New York Times. Uh, next up is Cindy Daly, and Cindy is quite a story in and of its herself. Um, she works for uh, the Department of Animal Sciences uh, in the College of Agriculture at Chico State and, as a professor. And uh, she spearheaded a project to develop an organic grass-based dairy on 85 acres of the uni university's conventional farm. Uh, the dairy celebrated its inaugural milking in March of 2007 and then became a member of the Organic Valley uh, Cooperative and is now supplying them uh, milk. Uh, the Chico State, Ch Chico State Organic Dairy is managed by a team of students which are involved in every aspect of the operation, including management, and uh, you know, you've got a very progressive management system. Um, let's see. Oh, and uh, you know, it's more than tests and studies, according to Professor Daly. It's you know, when its pastures are popping, she loves to watch the students turning the dairy, 75 Jersey cows, you know, out on the grass, and uh, it's a really exciting thing. I look forward to hearing more of that story. Um, next is uh, Mel Coleman. And uh, Coleman is another very uh, impressive name in this business. 
1944, Mel joined Coleman Natural Beef, a company founded by his father, Mel Coleman Sr., uh, which is you know, a true pioneer in the natural beef industry and the first to establish the standards and protocols necessary to garner the USDA's first natural label designating beef produced from livestock raised without the use of antibiotics or growth hormones. Uh, and as Executive Vice Pre President Mel was pivotal in developing the sales and marketing programs uh, that established Coleman Natural Beef as a leading producer. Um, he served as chairman of Coleman Natural Foods you know, for many years, and today he serves as Vice President of Special Projects of the Nyman Ranch Division. So we have lots of connections here at this table. It's pretty darn interesting, I think. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to hear some of these stories and what's, what's really going on here in the natural beef industry. Um, and last, last but not least is Mark McAfee, uh, who runs Organic Pastures, uh, CEO and founder. Uh, founded the company in 2000 to produce, produce grass-fed organic raw milk for consumers of California. Um, company now delivers the products on 17 of its own trucks, more than 400 stores, 15 farmers markets, including the Santa Monica Farmers Markets, who's our partner in developing this event, uh, and 50,000 delighted healthy Californians. Uh, Mark's a pre-med trained medical educator. Uh, he brings much of that to uh, his background and also is the founder uh, and chairman of the Raw Milk Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit dedicated in teaching farmers and consumers about raw, safe milk production and consumption. So, um, you know, this is a really interesting panel. We've got a full line of people, you know, ranging both sustainable meat, sustainable pork, sustainable dairy. So I'd like, um, starting at this end with Chris, if each of, us, each of you can take a few minutes, you know, tell us about, a little bit more about your organization and your farming background. So, so Chris, can you share? Okay, why don't you? So I grew up in New Jersey, and yes, New Jersey has farms. Uh, we are known as the Garden State, and I grew up on the uh, western side near the Delaware River. Uh, my granddad had a um, couple hundred acres where we raised Angus, turkeys, and um, horses, and Shetland ponies. And during, you know, we go to school and during the day and uh, have to go down to my dad's shop, which was about two, three blocks, four blocks away from our school, and work in his shop where we did farmer processing. Um, we would do all of the uh, beef and uh, pork and uh, lamb, veal that was raised by the local farmers. Uh, my dad had what they called a locker plant, and so um, we did all, we would wrap and freeze and uh, mark all the things, and the farmers could rent locker space, spaces and um, because they didn't have home freezers, and this is how they took care of all this stuff. So, growing up with that and going off to culinary school and later um, coming back into my dad's business, um, I saw an opportunity to take a bit of what I had learned, and this was the beginning of, of uh, the United States, finding this is early 1980s, and the restaurant revolution was starting to explode here and saw an opportunity to make specialty meat products. And uh, we did, and a year later my partner bought out my dad and we kept making this for the restaurants, these specialty meat products, and kind of fell into this whole natural organic because our products were never made with chemicals. My dad stopped using nitrites back in 1968 and there was a little uh, chain of stores in New England called Bread and Circus. And they had started buying our products and they started also asking questions where our meat came from. And they didn't even sell antibiotic free at that time. And um, their questions about how was it grown, what did they feed them, and their general practices really led us into questioning the farmers and getting them to try not using antibiotics, not using any of the crutches, the drugs that so many are used. And um, I really give them a lot of credit for putting us in that direction and um, the rest is kind of history because we never, we never looked back and only would buy our meats that were raised humanely without antibiotics and drugs and continue to produce our products without any chemicals in them. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Bill. No, well, my journey's slightly different. I started out in Minnesota, uh, a more, uh, not a rural environment, but I did go to the farmer's markets, commercial farmer's markets, wholesale farmer's markets with my father who had a corner grocery store and uh, frequented the, the market every day. So that was my initiation to food and farmers and spending a lot of time on the uh, rural landscape in Minnesota, uh, which uh, with uh, barns and pigs alongside and cattle outdoors and quite a different landscape than you see today. Uh, I had the good or bad fortune, depending on what you think, of driving down from uh, north of San Francisco where I currently live on, on uh, my ranch. And I had a time to, nothing like eight hours in the car uh, uh, to recap your life and, and think about issues that are important to you. And it also, I passed the uh, a community where uh, really agriculture began for me, which is halfway between uh, uh, Bakersfield and, and Stockton, a place called Dos Palos, which is, was just off Highway 33, which, uh, uh, and I spent time there, that was before I-5. So Highway 33 was the route north and south, and I was reminded of, of the genesis of agriculture for me, farming and ranching which occurred there as I was uh, helping a breeder who uh, bred dairy cows in that area. So I would help him go around and uh, artificially inseminating dairy cattle. Uh, from there, this was 1967, uh, from there I found myself in uh, uh, Berkeley and then Bolinas, California in 1968. Uh, there was a large group of like-minded people who were today would be characterized as trying to get off the grid, and we were suspect of the nation's food system and supply and decided that we were gonna raise our own food and feed our families and community. And basically, we had a bunch of freaks who were going back to nature, and uh, it was a, a very fertile community, and the place that I lived was really well suited to uh, raising to animal livestock as opposed to gardening or horticulture. So it was a, a rather windswept, open pasture uh, right on the Pacific Ocean, north of San Francisco. So uh, at, at, little by little, at that time, I first began to uh, raise uh, beef. First we had goats, and then we had some pigs, and then uh, we did, then we had received some beef, and it, it was a, uh, I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time in terms of my neighbors to mentor me for how to raise cattle. They happened to have the very best cattle and also uh, uh, in 1971 when my the first litter of pigs was born on my farm i had the, the benefit of working with this uh, wonderful guy from south dakota who found himself teaching school in west marin and had a sow that he brought with him who he loved dearly and basically that was the beginning of uh, nyman ranch uh, the nyman ranch meat company actually we i, I my passion was <coughs> farming and ranching and in order to have a viable farm and ranch, one had to enter the meat business. And uh, that was a very important uh, decision. Uh, it uh, enabled the business to grow uh, one customer and one farmer at a time until, uh, well, let's, until when I left the company in uh, 2006 to take up my missionary work, which I'll describe, there were, as, uh, Jim mentioned there are five to 700 family-owned farms, and I'm sure the company now is much larger than that, and, and Mel can and tell you about that. Uh, in 2003, I was fortunate enough to be uh, appointed to the Pew Commission that was investigating the industrial livestock systems in the country, and it was a really robust panel with, uh, chaired by Governor, Governor John Carlin, former Governor Carlin of Kansas, uh, Dan Glickman was on that, the uh, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and Iowa University Public Departments of Public Health were, were represented on the commission, as well as some of the leading uh, uh, philosophical thinkers today, I think systems people in agriculture, Fred Kirschenmann from the Leopold Center, who I think is probably the most thoughtful person in the, in the, in the sec sector today, as well as Brother David Andrews from uh, Catholic Rural Life, 
And then there was also a bunch of uh, industry people. Uh, the head of Cargo Meat Solutions was on the board, and uh, uh, the head of Bon Appetit Compass Catering. So it was a really uh, good cross section, and we reached a consensus on there about what was happening in, in animal agriculture. It enabled me to travel throughout the country to visit large places, uh, <coughs> poultry, beef, pork, uh, all sectors. And what happened to me in then 2003 through 2006 in that endeavor is really I, 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 I got an epiphany and I decided that the rest of my life from that point forward was going to be spent trying to create or recreate a more sensible animal agriculture system so that uh, uh, to produce food in a, a, a sustainable way in this country. And uh, that, uh, that was led me to uh, leave my post at Nyman Ranch, which had become a big company, and I'm basically a startup guy, and culture changes there. And it was a good time for me to exit, and with my wife, Nicolette Hahn Nyman, who was the chief counsel uh, for Waterkeepers Alliance and focused on environmental and animal welfare issues and uh, pollution issues around uh, confinement animal agriculture, we decided that we we're going to start a model farm and to create the kind of change or to pioneer something that we think would, would, is going to take us into the future. In the same way that uh, uh, back in the early 80s, the industry was laughing at what Nyman Ranch was doing, talking about antibiotic free and hormone free. Uh, and uh, they thought that was silly. And now these are the mantras that every meat company uh, is employing today. So we feel the future is a much more pasture-based, grass-based uh, system for grazing animals for certain, for the beef, lamb, and goats. Stop feeding them grain, show, and we're gonna demonstrate that you can provide great tasting meats in those categories without the use of grain. And also to, for, to provide a much more uh, hospitable environment for poultry and pork by allowing them to enjoy the outdoors and taking them out of the buildings that they have been so, uh, unjustly confined to in crowded situations, requiring the use of antibiotics and other man-made compounds to replace good husbandry. So that's where we are today, and uh, we've, uh, that's, we've using the name BN Ranch, and we're selling grass-fed beef from, to customers, uh, limited customers in New York and Boston and San Francisco, Santa Fe, and so on. Uh, we sell it fresh and uh, work uh, weekly with that. We also have a breeding flock of heritage turkeys, which we felt was a perfect complement in running our farm in terms of labor requirements and seasonal variations. Mm -hmm. So on our farm in uh, Bolinas, where that w which was the genesis of Nyman Ranch today, the location, we have uh, several hundred beef cattle strictly on grass, as well as a breeding flock of heritage turkeys that uh, yielded about 12,000 turkeys, which we'll market this year uh, on the BN Ranch label. So that's what we do, and uh, look forward to hearing about the others and answering some questions as we move along. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Cindy. Great. <clears throat> Boy, the mic is plenty loud. I can hear it echoing. So I assume you can hear me? Yeah, yeah you might want to actually move it back a little bit. They were super sensitive. Okay. Well, we go with that. Well, good. Well, it is a real pleasure to be here uh, today. I uh, want to thank uh, the Good Food Festival folks for inviting me. It's uh, an honor to be on this panel with this, uh, this group of people. And obviously, um, I, being the only female on this panel, I feel <laughs> quite honored, uh, frankly. And uh, my background um, actually began in Illinois. Do we have any folks from the Midwest here? Yeah. Yay. Fighting Illini. Anyway, I, um, I grew up in north central Illinois, uh, fifth generation farmers, in, in what I like to call uh, Michael Pollan's nightmare, uh, surrounded by corn, um, miles and miles of corn, soy. My folks also fed a lot of cattle. That was a big part of our business in, the, in those days and continues to be for my family. Uh, six kids, <coughs> Catholic. 800 acres, industrialized farming, commodity-based farming. You know, there just wasn't enough farm to go around. So um, I went on to school and uh, just kept going. I couldn't learn enough. 
And frankly, had I gotten that Y chromosome, I would be still there uh, farming conventionally, you know? So I was the lucky one. Uh, you know, things play out for a reason, I'm quite sure of that. So um, I um, went to school. I graduated the University of Illinois and animal science and, you know, passion about uh, agriculture, production agriculture in particular. I'm a farmer at heart. I'm certainly more farmer than I am PhD. And came out to California, did uh, more graduate work out there, couldn't learn enough, and ended up working for California State University. They hired me before I even finished my degree at UC Davis. Um, crazy um, as they are, they did in fact hire me in the College of Agriculture and turned over the dairy, the conventional dairy, to me. That was their second mistake, I guess. <laughs> So uh, through the process, uh, that particular dairy was bleeding badly. It was um, a conventional Holstein certified, registered Holstein herd. They'd been losing money uh, for the, the foundation for years and, and really you know, wanted it to uh, stop. Um, or they were basically going to weed out that particular aspect of our academic program, which didn't make an awful lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I come from a strong cattle background, actually had worked on many large 5,000 cow dairies in Tulare through all, all this, and, and had my fill of conventional agriculture because, you know, it, it's pretty obvious when you take a look at what's going on, not only to, farm, to family farms, but to the environment. It's pretty clear that there are some real serious, significant issues with the way in which we're making food today. I mean, the, the, the fact that the, the number of farms have dwindled to the point that they have is, is really, I um, mean, uh, everyone should be in an outrage about that phenomenon, but it's so chronic, it's so slow and progressive that we just don't have enough energy focused on that particular issue alone. You're losing a lot of wonderful um, institutional knowledge about how to grow food. You're, you're losing it because these guys are going broke in this commodity-based market system that we have here in the United States. It's, it's almost criminal. And so I grew up in that, and uh, after uh, my journey towards organic really started about 10 years ago when I started researching different methods of, of, of dairy production, and it was clear that you know, the pasture-based approach is, is the way to go. When you look at the nutritional aspects of the milk, the fact that it's higher in omega-3, higher in CLA, it's higher in all of these marvelous nutrients, it makes it much more nutrient dense, that's a no-brainer. When you look at the effects of organic farming on, on soil, and the fact that it builds soil this way, you know, rather than the soil erosion that we're used to in conventional agriculture, it's a no-brainer. Um, so uh, we really embraced that. We certified as much as the farm as we could without my getting fired, and we moved it forward with a grass-based program. We had to liquidate the cow herd, and we also had to bring on uh, you know, a partner because my job was really to make milk and to train students how to make milk. We needed a partner. So we looked around and uh, um, looked at the, the various groups out there, and boy, Organic Valley was the one to step up, and uh, we went to visit their farms. And not only did we visit their farms, but we made some really lasting relationships. We've got you know, producers out there that to me, you know, they're like family because they're salt of the earth, good people that are raising, producing milk off grass and doing it organically without antibiotics. Exactly. You know, that's the biggest shock to my kids that come into my class is that you can actually make milk without antibiotics. It's a shocker to them. It really is. So, you know, I want to thank Organic Valley for taking us on. Um, they made us part of their family. It's one of the largest um, farmer-owned co-ops in the country, and uh, they actually walk the talk, and so I appreciate that, and that's the, the last of the Organic Valley advertisement that I'll do, but I, I really appreciate the fact that they uh, stepped up to the plate and helped us with our program. I think we've got some Organic Valley farmers here. Raise your hand, guys. Awesome. All right. Hey, and, and these are real family farmers, so you know, take some time to go um, talk with them when you, when you can. Anyway, um, now we're, uh, 2007 is when we started. We're now six years into our program. We now have dung beetles back in our pastures. Do you know what those are? That's an indication that our biological system is back in play. 
You know, that's huge. Our cows, we don't need to deworm them because we manage and we go, uh, it's a managed intensive grazing program. It breaks the worm cycle naturally. So there's so much to learn, um, and it is so much more um, intellectual um, way to farm. It's a much smarter intellectual way to farm, and that's how we approach it um, when we teach our kids um, how to make milk organically. So with that, I'm going to close and pass the mic on to my uh, the colleague here next to me. <clears throat> well, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Mel Coleman. Our family, uh, actually both sides of our family started ranching in Colorado a year before it was a state. So. Uh, my son is sixth generation. He's actually not back on the ranch, but um, I was fifth generation. My dad had five, four brothers, and so um, we were a commercial cattle operation and basically grazing cattle and then selling our calves into the commercial market. After I got out of school, the commodity markets were very, very low, so what I did is that kind of by accident, I got involved in the agricultural irrigation business, spent... Um, three years in Washington State when along the Columbia River and the Snake River they were putting in center pivot irrigation systems and, and on that sandy ground actually were reducing, as compared to some of the flood irrigation, reducing water usage by 30 or 40 percent and uh, there was a whole lot of land that was developed up there. And then um, that company sold and I partnered up with another guy and we started manufacturing our own center pivots. And the idea that we had back then before it was even kind of commonplace to, um, I didn't even know what the word sustainable meant or being a real environmentalist or anything, but our concentration was, was to design a system that what we could do is use larger pipe sizes so that we could reduce energy costs. We were one of the first companies to experiment with low pressure systems so that we were reducing horsepower from 75 um, horsepower to run a center pivot that would irrigate a quarter section of land down to 30 horsepower. And so we started doing a lot of that kind of stuff and then we got into the drip irrigation and came up with the idea on some of these farms that didn't have power that what we started playing around with wind turbines. And actually in 1982 we actually had a wind turbine that was on the cover of Popular Science magazine. Uh, we were early enough in the business that we went broke doing that but uh, we were kind of playing that game. And then um, my sister-in-law and brother were going to the University of Colorado and my sister-in-law came home one night. Dad was really concerned about losing the family ranch because the commodity markets were so low that there was just no way. We were efficient operators, but there was no way that you could make money in the commodity business. And Nancy made the comment that a lot of the, her friends that she was going to school with at the university we're looking for meats that had been raised, that came from cattle that never had any growth hormones. And her family being in the, in the cattle business understood that there was a majority of the antibiotics produced were used at non-therapeutic levels later on after we owned the cattle in feedlots. And so it, it, my dad said that the hair on the back of his neck rose up. So what he did is that he saved some of the calves back, fattened them up, took them to a slaughter plant, and just like the USDA inspector rolls that they've been inspected by the USDA, he had this roll made up that said natural because at that point in time, he asked Nancy, he said, well, where do you shop? She said, I shop at a natural food store. He said, oh, that's good. I'll call it natural beef. And that's kind of that whole, <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of marketing money trying to figure that out, but that's how that came about. <laughs> and um, so he made this ink roller, rolled these carcasses, and um, with the term natural on it, the USDA inspector said, you can't do that. And Dad said, well, they're my cattle. I can do with them what I want. And anyway, the inspector finally threatened to throw them in jail. So it took him two years, but he went to the USDA and defined how livestock was raised without the use of antibiotics or growth hormones. And, and um, it wasn't a big issue then, even though we didn't do it, but it was also a 100% vegetarian diet. And so that was kind of the first definition for natural. It was the original definition of what natural made or meant, and it took the government six months to change it so it didn't have anything, so natural didn't have anything to do with the way that livestock was raised. So we just had to start marketing it for what we did. And then, and that was in 1980. And then in the late 80s, um, 
I, I got involved with uh, some of the other people in the organic industry and was a member of the Organic Trade Association when we wrote the initial definition for organic livestock. And, and I can remember then, we were sitting one time in Vermont, we had a two or three day retreat, and we were talking about what we wanted organic to be, and we were in hopes that, um, that it could maybe be 20% uh, for, of our fruits and vegetables in 20 years, and maybe on the livestock side, um, maybe 5%. And I think that where we are today with organic livestock, we're probably at 1%. So earlier today, um, I was in one of the other sessions, and one of the neatest things that I've seen, of course, I don't go to all the conferences around, but I've been to a number, number of them in my life. And the, the previous panel before us today, there was two farmers that were small farmers, and then there was a farmer that, that was the CEO of Earthbound Farms. And what it was is that it's the first time that I've heard in this industry where the big guys were embraced by the small guys. That's true. Because you see, if we're gonna change agriculture, it starts with us. We're all on the same thing. And it's not us against them. The reason that I told you the story about all those years in the irrigation business is because I never have met a farmer, even the ones that were pumping um, chemicals through their center pivot systems and through their drip irrigation systems, I never met one of them that enjoyed doing it. He had to do it because it was economically the only way that he could make any money. And so one word that I want to say here, and I was on a panel several weeks ago, and one of the other panel members, I, one, one panel member mentioned the word profit. And there was a panel member that was a professor from a Midwestern University, and she violently disagreed with the word profit. And so in order to be sustainable, we have to be profitable. And so the best way for us to change agriculture is to educate consumers and make it profitable. Anyway, sorry for the segue, but that's, I think, if, if, as far as I'm concerned, an important foundation. So I came back to the family business and began to really, um, I got involved in, of course, the Organic uh, Trade Association, the Organic Food Alliance, and, and finally Organic became part of the 1990 Farm Bill. And unfortunately, one of the things that meat and dairy, uh, when we really talk about small family farms and ranches, one of the things that we fight against today and is a, is a big problem is that is that there's been so much consolidation, that, particularly in dairy in the, in the uh, Northeast, there's just no processing plants, and so a lot of the smaller farmers are going out of the business as a result of that. If you look at a lot of the small uh, cattle ranchers and beef ranchers, uh, there's, there's, no pro there's a lot of the small processing plants, they're just not around, and so everybody's having to go to the, to the big ones. So today, um, after, um, say 20 years ago, I think that a lot of the, and even 25 years ago, a lot of the smaller organic companies, whether it was on the produce side or on the, on the livestock side, as they began to grow, the necessity to bring in venture capital came. And one of the things that I've ch seen change, I, I, I hope to see this change anyway, is that the original venture capitalists that came into this industry, what they did is that they kind of ran it like Wall Street runs today, and that is you're going to just squeeze as much as you possibly can out of it. So the financial institutions, in my opinion, also need to change to embrace what us as, and you or in, in, in the organic industry um, as thought leaders, we need to change the whole way that we look at things so that what we do is that we get down to some more basic values of what life is really all about. And, you know, it was interesting. I uh, got into an argument with a guy one time, and I, it slipped out of my mouth having not even thought about it, but I made a comment to him that I never walked through a graveyard and saw anybody's financial statement on a tombstone. And so I got to put the profit word that I said in perspective. But my passion now is to see small family farms and ranches remain sustainable. We have to protect the land. We have to conserve the land. We've got to treat animals right. 
but most importantly, what we need to do is develop the kind of markets and educate consumers so that they understand what the true cost of food is. Thank you. Well, I'm honored to be last. What a distinguished group of people to be sitting with, Dr. Daly, Mel, Tim. Um, I grew up as an Adele Davis baby. My mom had five kids in six years, and she used to line us up every day and give us cod liver oil and bruised yeast and molasses and talk to us about whole grain breads and all that kind of stuff in the 60s. And uh, in the 60s, you know, some of the people were doing that, some people weren't, but that's how I grew up. I grew up on a farm until I was 13 years old. I was the cheapest laborer and fed the cows and milked the cows and did all that kind of stuff with my dad. But then after high school, my first job after high school was I was a commercial welder in a, in a mine shaft in a mine up in the Sierra Nevadas. And I saw a guy almost killed. He was hitting the head with a big old timber. And the paramedics came in, they wore gorgeous orange jumpsuits and saved his life and flew off with him. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be a paramedic. So I, I went off and I got my pre-med taken care of and I became a certified paramedic and I absolutely excelled in it. There wasn't anything I didn't love about being a paramedic, 24-hour shifts and uh, delivering babies and defibrillating people and studying and, 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 and just touching people. And I really enjoyed that humanitarian outreach. It was wonderful. I did it for 17 years, ran about 15,000 paramedic calls. I also taught paramedic school and I taught medical education for the Fresno County EMS division. I was on a rescue team and just did everything. Uh, taught, taught, taught. Lots of CPR, lots of advanced life support, lots of medical education. Um, and so in 1996, my grandparents had passed away and the family farms became available and none of my brothers wanted to farm. And they'd gone on to become independently wealthy in their own right. And I was the only person left in Fresno um, that had any interest or, or feet still on the ground. And my wife and I, who's here this evening, Blaine's sitting in the crowd there, she came along to cheerlead, um, decided we'd take over the family farms, but we'd do it differently. We would certify everything organically. We would connect to our consumers. We would brand ourselves. We'd become vertically integrated. We'd try to touch our consumers and listen to our consumers. One of the interesting things that I hearken back to and kind of listen you know, in my experiences as being a paramedic was, it wasn't an EMS call I wasn't on for medical aid when I walked into a house and didn't see a pile of FDA approved medications sitting next to somebody who was trying to die. And there was never any good food in the house. And that dysfunction of always going to the doctor when you're sick and intervention after you're sick versus prevention before you're ill has been missed in America. And so that was, that was on my mind. And um, as we formed McAfee Farms, um, my whole awakening to organics, actually, I have to give credit to Odwalla. Artie Mangan was the juice sourcer, and in, in 2006, in November of 2006, they had a crisis. The apple juice had, had, had killed a child, and there was a lot of people sick, and it was just a terrible thing for, for, for raw apple juice. And uh, we had just had a problem in our farming operation where our Hong Kong markets had gone south because China had taken over Hong Kong, and we had no place to export our apples that we were producing on our farms. So I went to Artie Mangan and I said, hey, what do you think about joining up here and doing some organic apple juice and have a, a field safety program about this so you won't have this problem with kids getting sick from raw, unprocessed apple juice? And Artie said, well, that's a long shot, but boy, it'd really help us out. So that was my first real push into uh, organics was to certify the family farming operations organic and actually sign a contract with, or, organic, with uh, Odwalla and create value added. And so about five years on the outside of the apple juice container, although they did flash pasteurize, they brag about McAfee Apple Gardens and our field safety program. I went off to Chapman University, I got my certificate in HACCP management so I knew what I was doing and developed a field safety program for apple, produce, ap apple production. And Lynn Shear with 2020 came out and people talked about it. It was like, who, what, what's going on with this guy who's actually you know, checking farm workers for fingernails and you know, what's going on with apples and, and manure and all this stuff and where are you picking the apples from and testing and and I have to give credit to Bob Stovacek over at Primus Labs uh, to help develop this protocol. And so from that, I developed our organic apple production, and that was a segue into taking back the rest of the family op operations and creating Organic Pastures Dairy in 1999. And I didn't know about raw milk at all when I started Organic Pastures Dairy. I also was uh, very in love with Organic Valley, and they were in love with me, and it was great. We were producing uh, organic uh, milk, and I was shipping it off to be ultra-high temperature pasteurized, and it went well for about six months until I had people showing up from Los Angeles saying, hey, Altadena just went out of business a few months ago. There's no more raw milk in LA. And we were the southernmost organic dairy in California, and we were grass-feeding and doing all this great stuff, and um, we want your milk raw, and I'll pay you 12 bucks a gallon for it. And I was like, wow, beats the heck out of 250, you know? <laughs> again, profit, again, consumers, and so we then extended our business plan to include 
um, selling some raw milk to, into Los Angeles. And initially, it was just black market. We were just filling up Suburbans with ice chests and going down there and meeting people. And we met people. And that's something that a lot of farmers are not doing now is there's a disconnect between the consumer and the farmer, and there's a lot of people in between, processors and brokers and all kinds of things going on in between. But we met people, and the people told us stories about what raw milk would do for them. It was all about immune systems, and my whole pre-med just came to me like in a whirlwind about immune systems and all these antibiotic-resistant infections going on and ear infections and bowel disorders and lactose intolerance and asthma and allergies and, wow, this world of the immune system, the biodiversity of gut bacteria. And these people were telling me stories about how wonderful raw milk was and how they missed the Stuvies and how they missed Altadena. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity. What a void in the marketplace. And so Organic Valley was noticing that on my truck, my milk volumes were dropping. Because <laughs> every time they come pick up milk, I was selling more milk to LA. And they gave me a cease and desist order that says, in 90 days, you better stop selling milk because here I was on, on a Whole Foods shelf selling milk raw to the public and next to the Organic Valley container. And I uh, said, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll talk to you in 89 days. So in 89 days, we said, thank you very much. We're going to go on our own. We developed our own brand, and we built a small creamery, and we never looked back. And since then, we've grown to almost $7 million in sales. And I tell you what, I challenge anybody to get that out of 400 cows. Mm -hmm. Pretty incredible. And uh, instead of getting between $20 and $30 per 100 weight, depending on what market you're looking at between organics and conventional, we're getting 150 to 160 and there's an all-time shortage in California right now for, for raw milk. People have discovered its biological diversity, its wonderful wholeness. In fact, just this last week, there was a, a wonderful secondary study that came out of Europe. The primary study was done uh, in 2005 and six. the Parsifal study, which showed that children that drank farm fresh milk had a, a dramatically redu reduced incidence of asthma, allergies, and eczema, uh, just like breastfed kids have, uh, raw milk. But then the Gabriella study was just completed from uh, Basel, Switzerland, and George Loss and those guys came together and double-checked and confirmed the study. And in fact, these children that drank raw milk had these tremendously improved immune systems and asthma and allergies and eczema dramatically re reduced. Two big international peer-reviewed published studies. And here we hear the FDA saying, raw milk kills you with one drop, and you got 50,000 people drinking it here in California. So there's all these disconnects and political conflicts going on right now with raw milk because it's kind of politically incorrect it doesn't fit in the paradigm of you send all your milk to be processed. Uh, the farmer stands on his own. The farmer stands with his own brand. He's very responsible for food safety. Uh, I was able to engage my knowledge of what happened in, in 1996 with Odwalla in 1997 uh, with development of food safety plans to actually create a food safety plan for raw milk production. And for the last seven or eight years, I've been asked to speak all over the world. I've spoken in four countries, and I've spoken at Rutgers and uh, medical, uh, Stanford Medical School and all over the place as an expert witness on this subject. And the more and more I travel, the more and more I realize that every state had its own raw milk laws. And uh, it could be anywhere from completely legal, like in California, if they follow the rules, or completely illegal with mid mid midnight rendezvous and ice chests and moonshine runners, you know, that kind of thing. So this chaos of 50 states and 50 different rules and 50 different regulations was actually being celebrated by big ag. They enjoyed the fact that raw milk didn't have its act together and that people would get sick once in a while and uh, all these bad things would happen and they would use that to kind of oppress the raw milk market. And that wasn't happening here in California. We were having very consistent outcomes with what was going on with raw milk and it was available in stores and people were loving it. And so I, I I realized that we needed to have some leadership. We needed to have an, a nonprofit organization be established to help farmers do raw milk better. We know how to do it. We think we know how to do it. We think we know where to go research to figure out even better how to do it. There's a lot of things we don't know about raw milk because it hasn't been studied a lot. So we established the Raw Milk Institute, and its, uh, it's website will go live next week. We're very excited about the directorship of it, uh, a phenomenal executive board. And we're hoping that we can help farmers across America and internationally um, improve their ability to produce safe raw milk for consumers who are more and more looking to feed their families with whole unprocessed foods as they do with all organic foods that they want. They want whole and unpro unprocessed. So it's been quite a journey. Uh, it continues. I'm excited. I'm a fifth generation. My sons and daughters both have kids. My, we've been made into grandparents, and it's delighted to, I'm delighted to be here because I'm so connected to consumers. I've even got Warren wearing the t-shirt, and it, believe me, I didn't call him and say, put that on. Uh, he was here uh, on his own. But it's exciting to be connected to consumers and be relevant in their lives. So that's just my story, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>
So Chris, um, Applegate's really scaled up well, and every natural food store, every Whole Foods, you guys have like a big hunk of the shelf. How would you do it, and how will you continue to scale up? Because despite the fact that you guys are really big in the view of somebody like me, because you've got all this shelf space and important retailers, you're still just a tiny uh, speck of the overall lunch meat market. So how would you do it, and you know, how could you take over the world with, with your <laughs> brand of lunch meat, or certainly <laughs> go to another level where you really, really increase your market share? Well, first I'd like to say I think we're, we were very lucky. Um, you know, we were in the right place at the right time, that there was an awareness in this country. People are, uh, you know, the internet, you could very easily start to educate yourself on what's going on out there. And I think people became very aware that our food system was in deep trouble, that it's not sustainable to constantly feed antibiotics to um, animals and livestock. And this concerned them. And uh, we listened, we heard what the consumer wanted, and were able to give this to them. Um, I think going down the road, we do see that there are many challenges. Um, the good news is, is, according to the 2005 farm census, there were 76,000 new farms added to the um, farms in the United States. Um, the farm census says that most of these are small niche farms. I'd like to think a lot of them are organic. Uh, most of them are young people, and it goes against what you're hearing. The young people don't want to be on farms anymore, and the opposite is, according to the census, really happening. And supply is going to be um, critical. And for, uh, for us to grow or anybody here to grow, um, that the, I'm glad to hear universities are now teaching courses on organic. I was at a um, small farm gathering last Friday. A, um, the Devon, the American Devon Breeders Association um, had a gathering in not far from where I live and they showed the preview of the new movie called American Meat Documentary. Uh, Temple Grandin was there speaking also, and um, you know the, the, these people are really coming back. They were all young people, all starting to raise antibiotic-free <laughs> organically, and it is important um, that people do not get discouraged. Um, Rutgers University was there and the professor teaches um, soil science, and he, t he teaches how to keep good soil organically. He does not talk about chemicals. And to hear a university giving courses like this really is very important. So I think that's the future, that the, you know, the, we're all aware, becoming more aware of how important it is um, that we can feed the world with the systems I think all of us believe in. And as much as um, the CAFOs, the concentrated animal feed operations out there, uh, cry that's the only way the world is going to survive if they are in business, um, definitely is not true because um, we are seeing the farms coming back uh, and specializing and growing sustainability growing sustainable and, uh, and organic, and it is working, and people are um, embracing it. Thank you. You know, Bill, yesterday, um, <coughs> Steve Ells, the founder and CEO of Chipotle, spoke, and um, he showed his video, Back to the Start. And if you haven't seen Back to the Start, it's an amazing video. Willie Nelson singing Coldplay's The Scientist, and it depicts this um, a farmer uh, who you know starts as a family farmer with his animals on pasture and slowly but surely scales up and then you know they turn into a confinement and this is all animation over two minutes and you know after a minute you know he's like mega agribusiness pumping antibiotics into the um, 
into the, <coughs> the, the, the facilities and, you know, and the um, animals are just completely misshapen and disjointed. And at one point, the farmer has an aha experience, and then he tears it all down. And Willie says, we're going back to the start. <laughs> and, um, and then he tears it all down, and he goes back to being a family farm. And it was really cool. I mean, I had goosebumps watching, like, Steve, like, you know, talk about this. And he talked about his experience with you mm -hmm. and, you know, developing, um, you know, helping really you as a partner with Chipotle scale up, which helped you, of course, you know, find some new products that allowed you to create this company to that level. Uh, but conversely, you know, helping Chipotle realize, wow, this is great. This is something that we want to do. So my question after that long-winded <laughs> discussion is, is there a role for agribusiness here? And, you know, what are we going to do with them? They, you know, still produce 98% of the meat in America, probably maybe 96, I don't know, maybe 99. But um, they've got the power. They politically rule the roost. Um, <clears throat> how and how can we deal with them or can we deal with them or what's the future going to be like? Well, that's a great question. And, uh, what, what I see is, I, I feel we're at a, a tipping point. There's going to be a paradigm shift, and it's not necessarily because folks like us want to see change or consumers want to see change, but the, the agriculture as we know it, the industrial model that you know, you're describing here is so energy dependent. It, it, it's so dependent upon externalizing the costs to the greater society in terms of environmental degradation, in terms of public health issues that, that stem from that flow from uh, misuse of antibiotics. So, and then you couple that with the price of corn today in the world marketplace, that the change has to occur. So, uh, and, and then if you look at this question, it's so much a part of the public conversation. And this is the first year for this conference and next year you'll, you'll be standing room only, I'm sure. And people will be coming to hear these very issues articulated again and again and again, and updated as we see, uh, hopefully see change. Uh, w in, in order for this industrial model, which is, is providing us with what we think is cheap food, uh, unwholesome cheap food, not really cheap food because we pay in tax dollars for public health and for environmental degradation. But in order for that to change, people have to understand we need to eat less meat, maybe have meat smaller portions, uh, meat and um, fewer uh, meat meal occasions, as the jargon is. And well, just imagine if you cut your portion size in half, there would be half as many animals on, on the landscape. And it'd be easy to cut your portions in half. And if you had fewer meat meals every week, at half as many, then you could cut it again. So there'd be 25 percent of the animals that are on the uh, landscape today uh, could feed people uh, wholesomely and healthfully as, as, with as much nutritional and calor caloric need as we're getting today. So I, I, I'm confident that because that other system is really broken from an animal welfare point of view, from an environmental point of view, from a community point of view, from the real cost to the consumer, and because it is totally dependent upon cheap corn and cheap energy, which are no longer part of the world we live in, that there's going to be a, a profound change. And it also is going to be driven and fueled by consumers' awareness about the need for a different offering. And industry will respond to the consumer, and they will rationalize that response by the fact, well, we can't continue because we're doing it the way we were because corn is three times what it was two or three years ago, and getting diesel is whatever. You all, you all know what that is. So, I, I feel the change coming, I think the change is needed, and, and I believe it's a reality. All right. Thanks, Bill. Um, Cindy, Mel referred to the previous panel, which um, was talking about can local and organic feed the world. And Molly Jean from Harry's Berries, who's a Santa Monica farmer's market farmer, extraordinary, 25-year veteran, um, was sitting next to Will, Will Daniels, the VP, senior VP of Organic Integrity and Food Safety at Earthbound Farms and told the audience, we need earthbound farms because, quite honestly, 
I can't serve everybody, neither can all the other farmers market farmers out there serve everybody, and we need sustainably grown food to go to the masses, and especially in a place like, oh, Chicago, where, you know, we have a pretty short growing season. You know, if you want lettuce this time of year, that, or not this time of year, but in December, you got to get it from somewhere. Uh, you know, ultimately, maybe we'll have some locally grown systems and vertical farms and everything else, but we don't now. And Earthbound meets that demand for people who want sustainable food. And Molly says, we need them to get bigger. We need other people to get bigger. On the dairy front, Organic Valley has grown tremendously. You're now a, what, six, seven hundred million dollar company. You have 1,500, I think, family farmer owners. <clears throat> and yet, 1,600. Really, 1,600. That's awesome. Um, yet, organic milk is how, how much of the marketplace, and how do we go from what percentage of the marketplace it is today to 10 to 20 to 40 to 50, and how do we increase the level of pasture in organic milk? Because I think everybody agrees that the more, the more pasture an animal's on, the better, the healthier it is for the animal, mm -hmm. and the healthier it is for the quality of the meat. So, so first of all, what percentage is organic milk now? And secondly, how are we gonna, how are we gonna mm -hmm. blow this thing out? Yeah, currently it's about 2 to 3% of the fluid milk market, so it's not a huge component, um, at least not yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're working on it, aren't we, guys? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the plan, obviously, is to continue to educate the consumer. And if you look at the overall market share of organic milk, the growth has been phenomenal, even in an economic downturn. You know, we have suffered, I think, the biggest um, economic crisis of, of our history, have we not? and organic milk demand continues to climb, and so we're seeing sales continue uh, to climb. Uh, we kind of went flat for a little while there during the peak of the recession, but we're back on an upswing, and now we are currently in short supply, um, not only in the East Coast, where we have the biggest demand, but also now here in the West. So this was great news to those of us that are making organic milk out here in the Western region, but uh, the fact of the matter is is that we need more organic milk, and that's really part of, of my plan, is to you know, convert more of these uh, conventional kids who really have not experienced anything other than conventional milk, um, a new way, a new paradigm. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are different options out there. You don't have to do it the conventional way. And, and unfortunately, you know, I was raised in the conventional world. That's how we're cultured. It's, it's basically how we grew up. And so you're convinced that that's the way it's supposed to be done. And it's only until you get out in the world and actually see that there are other ways to make it happen that you can, you know, you have that personal growth, you have that epiphany, you have those moments where you say, ah, we can, we can change it, we can, we can change. And, you know, and I, I believe in Gandhi, you know, we need to be that change we want to see in the world, and um, we're going to try and do that with our students by educating those kids. Um, I know a lot of the farmers that are part of Organic Valley do it through internships where they try to educate. And uh, we have a variety of different types of programs to try and help organic farmers make the transition. I know that that's become a new funding um, stream within the USDA. They, knew ha they have uh, a new division there, and they've just up that allocation. It was two, you know, I think it was two to three million dollars, you know, and what do you do with two to three million in, in the entire country? To, that, it was a ridiculous amount of money that they threw at us, and it was um, not enough uh, to really get anything meaningful done in, in terms of organic research. That's changed, I think, with this last uh, administrative uh, move. We've now got a lot more money in um, organic research, which I think is helpful. We are seeing an upswing in the number of universities that are doing more in organics. So I think that the farmers have more resources to go to, and we have more farmer networks, because there's nothing like a farmer-to-farmer -farmer network to kind of help make that transition. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but it really is about uh, you know, trying to uh, change that paradigm. We want to change the, the culture of, uh, of milk production. Dan Sumners is an, um, an agricultural economic um, faculty member with the University of California, Davis, and he wrote an article in the Capitol Press that basically said that the conventional dairy industry is going to continue to consolidate. So, it is no longer necessary. Um, you know, if, if you're going to be a, a 2,000 cow dairy, you're basically obsolete. 
You have to be five, six, or 7,000 cows in the conventional commodity market to make it in today's industry. So, you know, my, my retort was, well, that's great, Dan. So I think that most of the universities in the country can basically eliminate their dairy science majors because there's not going to be any dairies for these mm -hmm. kids to go to. <laughs> what do we need? One or two, three maybe dairymen here in the California? Because we'll have maybe three 10,000 cow dairies? Uh, you know, and that's, that's basically the treadmill that they are on. And it's not as if they see any viable alternative other than getting out. And you're going to see another this year is going to be like it has in the last three, a mass exodus of dairy farmers out of the conventional market. And you may not care about the conventional guys, but you know, they're, they're farmers. That's institutional knowledge that we're going to lose from the agricultural industry. And, uh, and that, to me, is not a good situation. So we want to convert them. Great. Thank you. So it's really interesting and an honor for me to be on stage with all of you because I think each of you brings such an amazing perspective to um, this panel. Uh, and you know, having Bill, who really pioneered sustainable pork and was also doing beef, but you know, went to scale with pork, and Mel, whose company took sustainable meat or beef production to scale, um, is particularly interesting, and. And with all these changes, you know, Mel, I'm curious, um, what's it like to, you know, be now working for a company that Bill Nyman founded? It, that, that's a very good question, and it's, uh, it was really kind of an interesting life change that I had because um, all of a sudden what I did is that I came to grips with what, I really, what was really in my heart. And what was really in my heart, even though I loved the company that we had, and, and um, I was really kind of sad to see the beef part of that business go. I was very happy to see that our family ranch is still intact, and that's what the, the beef company was originally started for. But now what I found out is that I found out that we're, um, after all those years of experience in the agricultural irrigation business and, and living in different parts, I lived in the San Joaquin Valley for a number of years. I lived in the Pacific Northwest and, and spent a lot of time in the Midwest in the Ogallala Aquifer and because, in the irrigation days. And then as I um, started going around and talking to consumers, what I found out is that basically if you talk to a consumer um, for 5, 10, 15 minutes, they begin to understand a little bit more about where food is produced, how it's produced, and there was a whole lot of misconceptions. And so I had mentioned a little bit earlier that what my passion is right now is to protect farmland. I'll give an example. And, and the, well, the way that it started is that when the pioneers came into the United States, what they did is that they settled in the land that had the richest soil. But that's where the towns grew. Mm -hmm. And so now what we're doing is that um, the, the biggest threat 91% of, of the fruits that are raised in the United States are on farmland that's directly in the pathway of urban development, okay? 80% of our fruits and vegetables are the same. In 2007, we were going at a rate of losing 3,000 acres of our richest farm and ranch lands per day. And I spent one entire year of traveling in different parts of the United States talking to fifth graders in schools. Sometimes I could get three schools a day. Mm. And what, what I would talk to them about is to try to get their arms around what that was. 3,000 acres a day over a 10-year period of time is a 10,400-lane freeway from Los Angeles to Denver of our richest farmland that's going out of production. Since um, World War II, there's been a 60% drop in the number of farmers. And so, so the way that I look at this, and, and I actually had an experience that with, with one of the major chemical companies when we were trying to ask them if they would help us uh, develop a natural parasiticide, and what they did is that they basically um, lied to us, we found it out, and then what they did is that they lawyered up. And so I'm from agriculture. My heritage is in agriculture. So it's not us against them. What it is, is those people that were raised in a situation where they knew no other way. 
And in my opinion, the people that are to blame are some of the chemical companies that quite frankly know that the things that they're doing are wrong. And so what all of us need to be is it's not an us against them. What we need to do is we need to start dialogue with the people that may be caught up in the conventional business. And we need to uh, embrace them. We need to be profitable so that what happens is that they can say, what are you doing? I want to, I want to do this whole milk thing. What's going on? What were on? those numbers again? Huh? <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. 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 What that, are those numbers? Mark, that's the, 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 guy, the, the, the guiding oh, hand of capitalism <laughs> kind of moves Very things. Moving your business. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's, the, that's the biggest thing. The average age of farmers in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia is around that 55 to, to 60 range. That, that age category, 65, 65 and above, is the fastest growing category in agriculture. The 35 years and under is the fastest shrinking number. And yet, and I, you may know this number, but Organic Valley's average age of your farmers is 44 it's or much six. younger. It's, it's under 50. It's, it's under, under 50. It's, um, it's what? Uh, wow. I, think it's a, I thought it was a little higher than that, but yeah, at any rate, okay, and, and Bill, the, the network that Bill put together of pork farmers, the average age is now 46. And so this kind of agriculture is, is bringing people back in. Mm. But everybody in this room needs to be a, is proactive. And, and it's, it's not mm -hmm. us, it's not you against them. If, you, if we do it that way, we're not leaders. That's right. What we do is that we become antagonistic, and nobody wants to s you're doing it wrong. This is the right way. I'm proud of it. Okay? <laughs> and and, 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 and that's, that's, exactly the, that's exactly the answer you get. Yeah. But I've never run into a farmer, and I've been on hundreds and hundreds of farms that are in the conventional business, and they hate using chemicals. Okay. Thank, thank you. Can, can I just I want me, to interject? Wait, 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 no, I need to help him answer that question. Good. Uh, I'm hopeful that Mel finds the Nyman Ranch consumer brand as a platform for him to spread that mes message, and he can become a missionary for the things that we've talked about today, which are so critical to our future. And I can tell you from my experience having a young son, my view of the future has been completely changed, and it's urgent. So I'm hopeful that your role at Nyman Ranch will be helpful in, in moving the ball down the court and helpful in making change. Where a lot of that change is being made is also in the coffee shops around the country in these very rural little towns. And that's really where the paradigms shift. Because you know if they see a really successful organic dairy farmer, then the neighbor wants to know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? And you know, success breeds more success. So that's, that's really where we need to be. We need to be sharing the information. We need to be forthcoming. We need to, be, we need to bring them into the fold. So I wholeheartedly heartedly agree with what Mel just said. That needs to be part of our practice, is to spread the word. We all need to be preachers and, uh, and really spread, spread that word. It doesn't do us any good to sit in our soul, you know, little circles in the organic dairy conferences and just be talking to other organic dairy dairymen. We need to be talking to the conventional guys. We need to bring our neighbors and say, hey, come on, we're having some fun this weekend. We're going to have a conference. You need to come. Just don't tell them what it is. And and bring them in, just so that they can get comfortable with the idea. Yeah, good point. Could I, could I, could I do next week's sermon real quickly? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway um, 400 million acres of agricultural land are gonna be changing hands from one generation to the next or whatever in the next 20 years or so. And if we don't have some, some reforms at the policy level at USDA, capital gains tax and those kinds of things, what's happened is the, is the large number of the farms and ranches that have been lost in the past is because one generation can't afford to pass it on to the next generation. Absolutely. And so, and so getting involved with what the farm bill is all about, and it's a, it's a hard and it's a boring thing, but, the, but our whole farm policy needs to change to fit this paradigm that we're talking about because the current farm policy what it is is that 75% of USDA's budget goes toward food stamps. 
That's okay, but that's not helping the farmer. That's helping the people that need the food. But 75% of it, so it's billions of dollars that it's not coming back into agriculture. And then if you look at the amount that's paid into subsidies, all right, it, that, that needs to change so that, so that if we do get things from the government and we do get incentives as farmers and ranchers, it's because we're doing the right things from an environmental point of view, from an animal welfare point of view, and from a point of view that what we're trying to do is expand a whole new idea and different paradigm for agriculture. That's right, and everybody here votes, so 2012 Farm Bill is coming up, and these kinds of things are going to be um, discussed, and uh, it's really important that you do get with your state legislators and tell them that you want to incentivize sustainable agriculture, and you vote every day with your food dollars, and I'm really preaching to the choir here. You know, we, and we tell our students the same thing, and we've got 15,000, 16,000 students on our campus. We tell them every day that you vote every day for, you know, what kind of food production system you want want in the world every time you buy a sandwich, every time you spend money. You're basically voting for the type of paradigm that you want to see. Thank you. You know, we've got time for one more question, and then I'm going to extend this. This is such a great panel. We're supposed to end at 5.15. I'm going to go to 5.30. If you need to take off, certainly feel free, but this is too good to, to come to an end. So last question is for Mark. You know, Mark, I just saw the movie Farmageddon. And if you haven't seen it and you're interested in this issue, particularly raw milk, it's an interesting film, which basically shows a lot of persecution, both from the USDA and the FDA, upon unconventional farmers, particularly the raw milk people. Um, Mark, do you see any hope in kind of transforming the government's perspectives on raw milk, but also, you know, in some ways they can be more of an impediment than, than a support here. What, what do you think about that? I actually have incredible hope for the future. Um, there are two big things that are talked about at high levels of government now. It's creating jobs and medical care. And I tell you what, every time you see a successful little raw milk dairy, you see lots of jobs created and you see healthy people around it. And I tell you what, we've outsourced a lot of the resources that we normally would have, you know, 67 years ago to other countries. Food, and we've looked to the medical industry to cure our problems after we're sick. Lab band surgery, God knows how many drugs we're taking nowadays and no excuses for new diagnosis makes new patents for drugs. It's just a madness. It's now taking 20% of our GMP. In 1960, it was 6% of our GMP. So we're going the wrong direction and getting five years of less of, uh, of uh, longevity at $7,300 per person per year when countries in Northern Europe and Japan are spending 3,000, 2,800, we're spending 7,300, getting five years. We got a real train wreck going that way. So those that are awakening are going in a different direction saying, wait, prevent, eat well, exercise, do those kinds of things that are nutritionally based so we don't get on this train which is going down the hole. And so I see a tremendous hope. I think it may get a little worse before it gets better, but I do think it's awakening. And I would give a lot of credit to Facebook, the internet, the social media in terms of spreading the news that people have is their own scientific experiment. We don't have a lot of research going on in universities around the country because a lot of it's grant-based from big corporations that set forth their own policies and, and want to have research on doing their things. But what we do have is we have people doing their own experiment all the time. They, they eat grass-fed beef. They realize and appreciate the CRP drops, you know, C-reactive protein drops in their bodies, which is the indicator of inflammation because the good fats, the omega-3s and the CLAs are there. And what do you know? Their cholesterol start behaving themselves. These kinds of things start happening and all kinds of wonderful things happen with raw milk. So when you have that kind of real first-person science research being done in a family, that's no longer distrusting the 67 things they can't pronounce or understand on the ingredient list that the foods that they're eating from God knows where, um, they tell their friends and they start dollar voting and they start asking hard questions that can't be answered. And farmers start stepping up and saying, I can do that. And the more and more economic demand you create in this organization, this country we have, this capitalistic system we have, that generally people wake up and say, there's a dollar being spent differently than before. How can I follow that dollar and get more of it ourselves? And that leads us to a better country. So I'm saying there will be a pendulum swing. It's going to take a while. And it's going to get a lot of education. I spend all of my time educating. Literally, 90% of my time is about educating. I've, I've got a presentation later tonight. I've got one tomorrow. I've got several next week on my TV shows. It's a matter of reaching out to people and teaching, 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 doing what Dr. Daly does, teach, teach, teach. And in that, you will get consumer demand and ag will follow. Mm -hmm. We also do the same thing Mel's talking about, talk to farmers and give them. We meet in the middle 
and we'll have a better country and we'll have more jobs. And we'll have a heck of a lot better nutrition in terms of prevention. So I see a tremendous hope in the future and I see it coming from the people communicating uh, their nutritional, uh, you know, their nutritional experience based on eating well. And that's not easy to do because most stores don't have those kinds of food available. But if you spend your dollars, and especially in a mature commodity market system where you have uh, bankruptcy half the time, it's kind of a roller coaster from hell, right? If you take two or 3% away from that, that really shakes the paradigm cage. And they get the message strong and hard. The marketing department goes, hey, we don't want to look at this. It's the truth though. People are not spending dollars like they used to here and they're not doing, there's a reason why. And they're gonna say, we need to have more, mm -hmm. less processed yogurts, even though it's pasteurized. Let's put more bacteria back in there and let's petition the FDA to talk about immune system value for that. There's things you don't have, you don't have to go all the way to the organic raw side of raw milk, but you can certainly go to the organic and you can do less processed and better bacteria and, and, and do, th do some things that consumers will love and benefit from and swing that paradigm, that guiding hand of capitalism back to where it's America and our soils and our kids and our next generations which can actually uh, be optimized and, and benefit. Great, thank you. Um, questions, any questions in the audience? Uh, yes, over here on the right. <clears throat> a, a, a simple comment when you were saying, what are we going to do with big ag? I say, let them go to pasture. <laughs> and uh, the other thing <laughs> is, um, what is any of your opinion on the impending uh, cattle disaster in Texas? They're going to be slaughtering a lot of their cattle because of the drought and the fires. and. I'm curious what you think this will do to your markets. Mel, you want to touch that one? It's, it's going to make the cost of beef higher, and part of the reason is, is because the actual cow numbers are down and the demand is up. But I think that the industry usually goes through something like that. The cattle industry kind of runs in 10-year cycles, and there's usually either some kind of a drought or something like that happens, and even though this is very devastating, um, it's not totally uncommon. What will happen is that cattle prices and consequently meat prices at retail are gonna probably be extreme, they're gonna be high and probably be raising for the next two to three years, and then what will happen is the cow herds will be back up and, and it'll probably level out again. And I'm talking on, on, on as the beef industry as a whole on the, um, um, the what I'm going to call sustainable or or the never ever natural side and the organic side of the industry. The organic beef industry is very very small, and and part of the reason is because of the cost of organic grains. Um, organic feedstuffs are can actually be uh, more profitable in the dairy business than they can in the in the beef side of the business because of the value added that you can get out of yogurts and stuff like that. So I, I, I really, I hope that answers your question. That's my view. I'm not sure that it's um, correct, but that's my view. Sure. I think we have a question right here. Uh, I was talking with uh, Bob Martin from the Pew Charitable Trust yesterday, and, and so my question is about in your how you're organic, sustainable raising your livestock, how are you dealing with waste? Like what is your process for dealing with waste and runoff and how is that different from conventional? I think I can answer that. By the way, I'm animal welfare approved. Is that you, uh, your work you're doing with uh, the Pew Trust? Animal welfare approved? No, no, that's the Animal Welfare Institutes. Okay, because they have some Pew Trust money. That's possible. Okay. Yeah, actually uh, Andrew Gunther's here who, he, was, he was going to moderate this panel, and then a major donor said, yeah. Andrew, I want to meet with you. So he's off raising money. In answer to your question, <laughs> when you have a pasture-based system, your manure goes directly to the pasture, well, and you've completed your, your nitrogen <laughs> loop without having to go through a lagoon or a waste system. Now, there may be some waste accumulation from some parts of the, your, 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 you know, your dairy environment where you actually accumulate some, but that's actually very important to be able to accumulate that, to be able to take it and put it on your almonds or put it on whatever other crops, because the fertility brought by animals is something really important uh, in terms of an integrated organic system. 
And so it's important to get animals back on the land or near the land so we can actually have the fertility, not only for the biodiversity of the manure, but also other building elements, the fertility elements that are found in the manure. And Daly, Dr. Daly, you know about this stuff, I and mean, this is stuff you study all the time. Oh, absolutely. It's all part of the system. It's part of the agroecosystem, and so that manure is valuable nutrients. We don't see it as, as waste. Um, we don't call it waste. Uh, those are nutrients that are you know, waiting to be you know, recycled through our system. And we utilize, you know, that was the biggest change. We went to conventional over to the organic system. We basically mitigated 70% of our waste, our manure, um, by um, applying it directly to the pasture, which raised the overall fertility because, you know, that's just teeming with biological life. And that provides food for the dung beetles and a variety of other kinds of, uh, of, of biota that are there part of this system that makes the soil thrive. And there's more living organisms in the soil than there is on top. And so we're feeding the soil with that nutrient. And we, we compost all of our scrapings. We don't, um, I, I'm working on a system now to recapture our wash water so that we can recycle those nutrients as well. I think that's a sign of a good biological farmer is how well they recycle um, within their system. You shouldn't be losing nutrients, not in, not in a good biological system. Other questions? Over here. I guess I got the mic. Um, oh. I'm sorry. Uh, I want to follow up the point the guy in the gray sweatshirt made earlier about how um, if we had more meatless uh, meals, that would lower the impact on the land. I would like to just ask that from a different perspective. If we were really animal friendly, uh, you know, the whole life cycle of animals that went into, and I'm vegan, I don't eat them, but I want to ask this anyway. How much less animal should people be eating in this state for animals to be raised in a substantially more humane manner? How would that change if animals could actually grow up really, really well. How much less would people have to eat for those people who still eat it? The question's for me, I assume. Yeah. Well, I think it's undeniable that we have a culture of people that eat too much. Uh, and I think it's undeniable that there are a lot of uh, public health challenges for the country that stem from nutritionally related situations. Uh, uh, so I, I, I don't think there's any equivocation anywhere on that. And uh, meat is a very nutritious food, but I believe we're consuming so many more calories in every category that if we were to reduce them across the board and think of meat as the seasoning or the condiment for whatever else is on the plate, uh, it would go, we, we could get the nutritional value necessary for a healthy life uh, with far less uh, uh, much far less amount of meat, and uh, I, I, in terms of the benefits of the environment that would stem from that, in terms of the nutrient load that Dr. Daly, uh, uh, you know, hinted at, it, if you have fewer animals on the landscape, the manure is capable. The land is capable of benefiting from the new manure. It's not a waste product. When you begin to concentrate large numbers of animals in a small area and, and expect the soil to receive that nutrient load. It doesn't work, that's a failure. But, uh, and it's too expensive to ship it down the road to another farm in most cases. But again, if people would begin to think uh, seasonally about eating meat, perhaps, there is, there's a season to eat it, and if there's a season in grass-based agriculture when the animals are at their finest, and should be slaughtered, and that's when you eat them in the same way you'd eat a strawberry, a nectarine, or a rutabaga. So the kind of evolution of food thinking, the kind of stuff that Adele Davis would, would be. <laughs> if those of you who are old enough to know about Adele, I wish she had lived beyond her 80 years so we would maybe we'd believe in her more, but it, it, it's, it, it's, just, it's, it's not one simple answer. So if, if people eat less meat, they have fewer meat, meal occasions, and they think about meat seasonally, it, it would really change and improve the, not only the life of the animal, but it would improve what's happening in the animal livestock industry on the landscape. So, does that help? Okay, thank you. Good, we've got time for one more question. 
Um, hi, my question was for the raw milk gentleman from Fresno. Um, Mark. I'm not that gentle. I'm sorry. <laughs> just joking. Um, I was just curious. You talked a lot about <laughs> going around the world and educating people and things of that nature. How, because we have so much um, agriculture and food that comes out of the Central Valley, how do you feel that your experience and your influence and in education, like how much traction do you feel you have within that community? Very little. Um, the dairyman I do. What do you think it would take to change that? Well, the dairyman I do know, actually, we have a lot of mutual respect for one another, but I really don't have a lot of interplay with dairies because they're not buying my product. I talk to consumers. I talk compliments, complaints, uh, you name it, on a daily basis, emails, hundreds of emails. It's about my management of our consumers and our cows and food safety and everything in that entire business. It's absolutely uh, outside of the current set of paradigm uh, structures that are going on. And, and that's one of the reasons why the value added is there. And I'm taking personal responsibility. And we have a food safety plan. We test. We do all kinds of things. But we're accountable to our consumers. So my impact on my fellow farmer is actually minimized. Um, what I do try to show them is an example. And one of the things I, I do, I do step out. And I do go to dairy uh, meetings. And, and I share with them. I say, hey, guys, look at your own research done at UC Davis where they said, hey, listen, less processing is better for, for milk. And Dr. Bruce German's work, uh, he, uh, the Milk Genome Project's brilliant. And uh, talking about oligosaccharides and all these beautiful things that are, that are changed when you process. And if they would look at their own research they spent millions of dollars on, that would be the segue forward to the nutritional links that need to be made for medical claims on milk, which is a phenomenal probiotic base for healing human gut, which is an uh, immune system abysmal free for all, free for all right now with 20,000 people a year dying from MRSA and you just name it with all the issues going on with Crohn's and celiac and irritable bowel syndrome. And that's all gut flora stuff, nutrition stuff. And so there needs to be an investment in the dairy industry, in my opinion, to go and find value in their food product, and if, if there isn't, then change so there is, and get medical claims so they can actually get value added for it, so the work they do makes a difference, and connecting to real people for real reasons. And that's what I do, and that's why I get value added, because so much of my medical background links up directly with what I do with people now. It, and it, it's literally where food meets medicine, and it has always met medicine. I mean, Hippocrates himself said, let food be your medicine, medicine be your food. And uh, now we've got the USDA saying, hey, get to know your farmer, get to know your food. Every family needs a farmer. That's beautiful. But when you do it, it looks just like raw milk. Scarier than living heck to the big industry that doesn't want that to happen. Because local food systems that have unprocessed, less processed foods that go to local, uh, or, you know, local destinations and have communication between the farmer getting to know their consumer is scary to somebody who doesn't want the farmer meeting their consumer because the processor is going to lose out. So this is a very exciting evolutionary time where education and in my opinion and dollar voting leads the way and there's going to have to be a lot of exampling and sharing and scary thin ice to, to cover to get to that other place where it's going to be much better for America and the rest of the world. Great. Thank you. Let's have a big hand for this, this panel.